Good people of Aintu, you are a sight for sore eyes today. Fair play to you. This is a terrific turnout from people right across the country. It's absolutely wonderful. And it shows the energy that is in our movements. It's hard to believe that this is the first time, probably in about three years, that we have met face to face in a group like this. It didn't happen by accident. And I want to thank everybody who has put their shoulder to the wheel in relation to the creation of today's event. We don't have a paid staff that puts this type of organization together. This type of organization comes about on the basis of volunteerism from dozens of people have put this day together. I don't want to name names, but it would be wrong for me not to mention at least two people in relation to today's organization. And that's Mr. Emmett Hope, the Kahirla who is down <laughs> They don't need to get paid, they'd like to get paid, but they don't need to get paid because they are like you and me. When they see wrong happening in this country, they don't stand idly by. They get up off their knees and they start working and we're so glad for it. Um, I also want to thank today, it's really important, uh, uh, Councillor Denise Mullen, uh, who is uh, our... Um, Deputy Leader of the party. Uh, De Denise, unfortunately, didn't put her name forward for Deputy Leader's position uh, on this occasion, uh, but I want to thank her deeply for the services she has given our organisation over the last number of years. Councillor <laughs> Denise Mullen is a tower of strength. Denise has faced more adversary than any of us will see in our, in our lives. And on each occasion, Denise gets back up and she keeps fighting for justice and truth and for people who have suffered in the same manner that she does. She's a rock of strength and she will remain a key part of the leadership of this organization. I just want to thank the many speakers that attended today's event as well. So, you know, it's a good sign in an organization such as, as ours that we can attract such key people in civic society who take us seriously as an organization and address us in terms of the issues that they're working on. And the people that we have speaking uh, to us today are involved in so many key aspects, bread and butter, life and death aspects of society around Ireland. And they give their time to us to educate us about the work that they're doing. So, Mila Buikas, Austin, fair play. <laughs> Listen, this organisation of ours has grown substantially in a short period of time. In the last elections, AIM2 collected 55,000 votes across the island, uh, island of Ireland, which is an incredible figure. We have now 1,300 members who are part of this organisation right uh, down the country. And we have six of the best elected representatives from Wexford to Derry at the moment who are fighting for people who are suffering in a large way. And all the polls over the last while have shown our organisation, the only organisation that has not got state funding, to be polling roughly the same as the Labour Party, the South Dems, the Greens and People Before Profit. If we got a scintilla of the level of press publicity they get, imagine where we would be now. something different. We have activists who have a conviction about the major issues that are affecting uh, people's lives at the moment. And those activists are willing to give up their time around the country to build this organization and help their communities. And as long as we stay true to our core objectives, I believe we will gain more and more of those activists over time. So listen, in this speech I want to address a number of issues. First of all, I want to address the political culture that exists in Ireland. Because I'm a strong believer that that political culture has led to many of the problems that we're suffering at the moment. And I'll give an example of that political culture. So recently we saw two uh, Fianna Fáil junior ministers, uh, in advance of a cabinet shuffle, seek to reposition themselves on the issue of the rights to life by flipping from being pro-life to being pro-choice, uh, just before a cabinet reshuffle came. Now, I found that quite extraordinary. 
Because how can an elected representative one day believe that the right to life is the most important human right that there is in society, that no other rights can be guaranteed unless you have the rights of life? How can an elected rep believe that the unborn child is a living individual, human being, and therefore entitled to human rights on one day and the next day uh, flip? And how can a person lose the compassion of trying to protect everybody's lives and then the next day vote for abortion on demand for any reason? Now, let me tell you, if you cannot trust an elected representative on a key fundamental right, such as the right to life, what in God's name can you trust that politician on at all? <laughs> the, the abortion law has changed Ireland radically over the last number of years. 23,000 individuals have lost their lives due to the abortion law north and south. That's 900 classrooms of children who are simply not here today as a result of that change of law. And that is a humanitarian crisis of enormous, enormous levels. And it's one that we can't forget because sometimes people of our objectives, we don't see it in the news. It's not written about in the newspapers, North and South anymore. Purposely, it never left the news sheets before the referendums or when the law was changed in the North, but now it's disappeared. But we can't let it disappear because it's happening every day. And we have to energize ourselves on a daily basis to get politically active so we can reverse that horrendous law, and that has to happen shortly and soon. Now, the other issue that I want to speak about here is we need also to build an Ireland of compassion, empathy, and kindness. And that's why I was inspired by Christian Day's uh, speech there earlier. Because it's important that we just don't focus on the right to life up until birth. That we actually focus on the right to life at all stages of life. That we, as a political party, look to see how can we support mothers and fathers' right through life to make sure that they have the economic confidence necessary to be able to raise their children to that child's full potential. Surely that should be the objective of our, of our organization, and that's key to us. So we are pro-life for the whole life as an organization. I want to focus on other aspects of society at the moment and how that political culture is ruining uh, Ireland at the moment. We have a situation where Ireland is suffering from a confluence of crises. The cost of living crisis, the housing crisis, the healthcare crisis are hammering families across the 32 counties. Now, I believe that a large reason for these crises is because we have a political class that is extremely detached from the people that they're meant to serve. And I mentioned earlier that TDs in this state will get a pay rise in this year of exactly half what a pensioner earns for the whole year just a pay rise increase. Now that's an incredible figure. And I believe that those types of pay rises in such a difficult time means that those politicians can relate to the experience of the people they're meant to represent. They're not having conversations around the dinner table saying, how do we pay this bill? They're not lying awake at the moment and saying, how can we afford to put fuel in the petrol, afford to get childcare, and get to work on time? Those questions are not, those questions are not taking over those families' minds. And as a result, they are radically detached from the people they're meant to represent. In the north of Ireland, we have members of the Legislative Assembly who haven't done one day legislating in the last six months and are still taking down their salaries. That is absolutely wrong and has to change. And I want to give credit to Councillor Emmett Doyle from Derry, who actually has proposed a bill that would reduce their salaries to the minimum wage while they refuse to work. And I would like us as an organisation to support that. had to live on the minimum wage, it would certainly focus their minds in terms of getting their jobs done for the people they're meant to represent. Another issue that I want to talk about is the issue of competency in government. This is really, really important, and I mentioned this earlier uh, briefly too, that we have lifelong politicians who never held a job anywhere before in their lives, and they, have ne they don't have practical experience in terms of fixing the issues that are they're suffering. And you know, I can see uh, people here who on a daily basis are coming across you know, the, the reality of dealing with the state who is oblivious to their common sense needs. 
uh, at the moment. And I do believe that there's a malaise in Irish society at the moment. Uh, and you know, that lack of competency is, is causing damage. I remember speaking to a former Fine Gael minister and he said to me, Padre, he says, you know, when you go into a department, you have dozens of um, senior public servants there. Now, many public servants are fantastic people. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to uh, disparage public servants. But in the, in, the, in the particular departments, you have very senior public servants on significant money, many of them have PhDs, many of them in there for 30, 40 years, and they can think of 100 reasons why something can't be done. And literally, I believe politicians, after a while, in those scenarios, start to recede and start to start working for those uh, departments, instead of it being the other way around. And that has to change. The other problem is that many of these politicians don't have an ideological compass. They don't believe in a certain an objective which they will fight for. They're not there to fight for things. They're there simply to facilitate the issues of the day. And you need a politician that has some compass with regards to what's right and what's wrong. If that doesn't exist, you're in trouble. They'll stand for nothing uh, in the end of the day. of serious difficulty here is the accountability issue. North and South Irish politics is an accountability-free zone. It doesn't matter what you do. Somebody will write a report to find out that everybody was wrong in the first place. Everybody's wrong, nobody was wrong, and as a result, nobody is ever held to account. Believe me and you, if there's no accountability in this country, there is no change. We are cursed to repeat the mistakes year after year, and it is a major objective of aim to, to inject accountability into the, in the political system, and we will make sure that that happens. I want to talk just on the cost of living crisis at the moment. And I believe that the government is actually the reason for a lot of the costs that actually people are suffering at the moment in this country. <laughs> we are paying more tax on fuel in the state today than we did before the cost of living crisis. Absolutely horrendous. The state are giving 1.2 billion euros back in electricity credits, according to the, uh, the budget that's just gone by. Okay, they raised more just in the differential of the higher VAT rate and the carbon taxes and the increases of the ESB bills in the last six months than they're actually paying people back. So they're taking the money out of your pockets with one hand and they're giving it back with the other hand and they expect it to get a tap on the back. They're getting no tap on the back from us. I can think of other things we'd like to give them instead. <laughs> the same here is increasing carbon tax in a price cost of living crisis. How detached from people must you be to increase the tax on fuel when people can't afford fuel? And here we are, we have a situation where the, we're the only state in the whole of the European Union without a gas storage facility. Because of the green ideology, we have now become most exposed to interruptions in gas supply and increases in gas prices. It's mind-boggling stuff. And in the middle of, a, of an energy crisis, the government decides to restrict the use of turf. What is going wrong with the government? What is wrong with them? That's, they seek to reduce access to, to fuel in a fuel crisis. It does not make sense. Only aim to vote against the carbon tax. Only aim to unequivocally oppose the restrictions of the turf, uh, uh, the turf restriction. And that shows you a party that has a backbone and is able to push back against the decisions of this government. <laughs> Another example of, of governments that are just not capable of doing things. We had Minister Ryan recently, he gathered all of the energy ministers from right across Europe for a very serious meeting about wind turbines offshore. And he spoke in measured tones afterwards about the, the developments and the progress they're making. In 20 years, the state built seven offshore wind turbines off the country. Now, if, if that doesn't show you the incapability of doing the work in hand, you know, what does? It's absolutely incredible that the government did that. And again, you know, we've been pushing as a party for the government to, you know, reduce the, the vat on fuel. The government says it can't do it. And um, yet, Spain has reduced uh, the vat on fuel. We've asked the government to decouple the price of non-gas generated electricity from gas generated electricity. And um, the government said it can't do it. That the European Union is, is going to do it. 
However, we have a situation where uh, Spain and Portugal have done it for their countries. Um, we have asked the government to um, implement a windfall tax uh, with regards to super normal profits that energy companies are making when people can't afford to turn the lights on. And the government said, no, let the European Union do it. It reminds me of Homer Simpson when he ran for the mayor. His literal uh, slogan for that particular campaign was, why can't somebody else do it? And that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what it was. It seems to me that the only things that are going to be warm this winter in this country are the government's hands because they're sitting on them for so long at this stage. <laughs> crisis, the government closed down Lanesburg and Shannon Bridge. Two power plants that were providing significant employment in areas without significant employment and actually creating energy. And we've called for them to be reopened, the only political party that has the backbone. <laughs> and another issue as well, there has been very little analysis in the political spectrum of the cost the restrictions had in this country in terms of the, the cost of living. Now, we've had a, the longest and most severe restrictions of any European country. For the first quarter of 2021, the government closed down every building site in the country. Not a house was built. The, the, the country with the worst housing crisis in Europe was the only country to close down the building of houses for a quarter. What sense does that make? When it comes to the restrictions, we were the only political party to look for a commission of investigation in how the government handled uh, the restrictions. There was absolute travesty uh, in the nursing home areas. The people who were most exposed were left most vulnerable. More than half the people who died of COVID died in a nursing home or a hospital. Two areas that were in the control of the government. And the government carried out actions which I believe directly led to that. So we looked for accountability. And where was the accountability? It was nowhere to be found. We have a bill seeking a commission of investigation, and the government are opposing it tooth and nail. And as well they should, because accountability will focus on the government's actions. Absolutely. Just, I want to turn to the north of Ireland because the, the cost of living is biting hard in the north of Ireland at the moment, and it's made worse because the political system in the North has ground to a halt. The democratic institutions in the North have been in abeyance while hundreds of thousands of people are in a cost of living crisis of epic proportions. We have the NHS who is actually saying now that they are, they are going to suffer because people can't afford uh, fuel, keep themselves warm, and people can't afford to eat. And that's going to put further pressure on the NHS. We've had disability action which has said that their members, some of their members who are most vulnerable, will lose their lives in a situation where there's no uh, uh, supports given to them over the next while. And yet we have an executive that thinks it's okay not to do the job. It is morally irresponsible. It is grossly insulting to the citizens of the North to do nothing when people are in so much pain. And we demand the DUP go back and form the executive so we can start to help people. Get... <laughs> in no other state would it be tolerated. In no other situation would you, you have citizens in such difficulties and the political party sitting uh, idly by. And actually in no other profession. Now imagine you know, nurses, teachers, postmen going to work and say, listen guys, I, I think I'll take the next five months off, but you know, keep the salary coming into the bank accounts. They would be laughed at. They would lose their jobs ASAP. But that detachment of the political class, that L'Oreal attitude, that they are worth it, has to go, and we will make sure that it goes. Yeah. In this particular situation, you would have the political class seeking to reform Stormont. Only one political party aimed to is seeking to reform Stormont. So we are actively looking to change the law to stop one political party being able to prevent an executive being created 
and crashing the executive. Nobody should be able to throw the, the, their toys out of the pram and stop everybody else getting on with their work. Uh, and we brought that uh, idea to government. And I will say, and I, I welcome this, uh, I, I've raised it with the teacher the number of times. He has batted it back and said no. But on Thursday, there was a change of heart and the teacher has said for the first time that yes, the institution will have to be reformed if this keeps happening. So finally, we are starting to make headway with the political establishment in relation to this. Um, but reform is necessary, because look at this, we're going to have potentially an election in the North in 6, 8, 12 weeks' time. What is the logic of an election in 12 weeks' time if everybody's simply going to go back into the situation where they're refusing to work with each other anyways? So this has to stop. And, you know, one thing I will say to the people of the North, if we keep voting the same way we always vote, how can we expect things to change? I know in the last election, I spoke to people and they said, oh, we have to vote to keep the other side out. But voting to keep the other side out is keeping everybody out. And people need to change their votes and realize that the bread and butter issues that are bearing down hard on their lives will only be fixed when they vote for parties outside of that divide. And that's why I'm asking the people of six counties in the next election, be it in January or definitely in May, when we roll out our wonderful candidates in that election, vote AIM2 and you will get things fixed in the six counties and that's a guarantee. <laughs> right now in, in, in the north of Ireland there's very little tax raising power. So people like uh, um, Councillor Emma Doyle and Councillor Denise Mullen are doing their best at councils to see if they provide supports in relation to uh, people who are suffering. So ideas such as the Warm Bank that we have uh, provided, um, etc., and even salaries that have been foregone to create you know, bursaries to help people have been done. But we need to get to a situation where the, the North of Ireland is able to raise taxes itself and able to spend that money. S Scotland raises 22% of its public spending every year. Wales raises 10% of its public spending every year. The North raises 5% at the moment. And the reason is, is, is not doing so better than that is because of the collapsed political system. We need to put it on a stronger foothold and we need to start devolving power from London back to Ireland. Mm -hmm. In relation to the legacy bill, uh, we have stood very strongly against it. I was campaigning in Washington DC with senators, congressmen and congresswomen uh, just a number of months ago, urging them to put pressure on the British government not to proceed with the legacy bills. And it, it's very important to us, especially, you know, given that we have a spokesperson on legacy in Councillor De Denise Mullen, uh, and we will fight that legacy bill. And we heard, you know, I, I found it hard to listen to Breach uh, Boyle here today. It was very hard to keep the, the tears from the eyes of people. People just simply want the truth. They, sim they simply want justice to find out what happened, and that cannot be withheld from them, absolutely not. And um, I want to say as well that constitu constitutional change is coming, and that is the truth of it. Unionism is no longer a majority in the north of Ireland, and the governments of the south can't keep running away for that. We have to prepare for change. And let me tell you, we in AIM2 are a practical political party, and there's lots of common sense things that we can do now, today, that will improve people's lives. And it will make it easier to transition to unity on that sunny day when it happens. But let's do the work now in, ter in terms of, of improving people's lives. And what I mean by that is, you know, how to deliver services better north-south. So get rid of the north-south enterprise uh, barriers, the agricultural barriers, the, the tax and employment barriers, so people can do more trade north and south. Give the rights to um, our, our new MLA, some of them you'll, you'll see here in front of you, to sit in the doll and represent their constituency. I want to see a day where someone can say, I want to be a TD for Tyrone. I want to be a TD for West Belfast. I want to be a TD for Fulham. And that's what we're working for at the moment. But that step of giving MLAs speaking rights in the doll doesn't cost a penny. It doesn't take anybody's rights off. It simply improves uh, the situation. We want to see Invest NI, and the IDA and Enterprise Ireland amalgamated. Right now, they're, they've got offices all around the world costing us money competing against each other. They should be the one organization. Tourism Ireland, you've got three tourist organizations in this country, Baltic Ireland, and you have, obviously, Tourism Ireland and Tourism NI competing against each other, amalgamating them, getting them working together. And also, we need a spatial department on the island. Like, a number of years ago, 
A road was built from Belfast, a motorway was built from Belfast to Newry, and instead of going straight on to Dublin, it turned left for the wonderful wee town of Warren Point. I have nothing against Warren Point. It's a great town. But logic would have dictated, spatially, that we would have built the motorway on to Dundalk uh, to make sure that it would have been of benefit to people. We have to stop developing this country where our backs uh, to each other. I want to speak briefly about the housing situation that's besetting uh, this country. This government has created record house prices, record rents, and now we have record numbers of homes. That is an incredible thing. The government is a record-breaking government for all the wrong reasons when it comes to housing. What did the government introduce in the last budget? They introduced a levy on concrete. They introduced a levy that's going to make it more expensive to build houses that people can't afford right now. Where is the logic of that? And again, that shows the detachment that exists from the government to the experience of real people. You know, 30% um, of a home currently in this state is actually tax or some kind of government uh, money. That's an incredible thing when the price of houses are so outside of, of people. And I want to, to thank Mary T for her speech on Micah. We believe whole, absolutely the government has a responsibility to pay the families so that they can get housed as a result of Micah. It was the Fianna Fáil government that created the Micah crisis. Fianna Fáil government created a light touch regulation system which allowed people to sell dirt and claim that it was a building material. And as a result, it's like quite a bit blocks on people's homes. It's simply breaking apart. The people who caused the crisis should be pursued for the cost of the crisis. The people. <laughs> Maybe the next generation of home buyers pay for that crisis is absolutely wrong. I also want to talk about the 160,000 houses in this state that are empty at the moment. Now, I mentioned the levy tax, and there's a heap of taxes in homes, 30% of taxes, and once they move into a house, you have to pay the property taxes. How come the government is not so interested in actually taxing empty homes? We would like the, the 160,000 houses to be focused with regard to tax. Now, we know that some people can't afford a tax on an empty home. We know that our, there are personal reasons in some cases, be it the death of a loved one or some particular issue, that that home can't be moved into a, a livable house. But we want to offer grants to those people so that they can invest in those homes and get them back up to to standard for living. There are three and a half thousand empty homes in Meath, and there's 4,000 people on the housing waiting list. Where is the logic of that in the middle of a housing crisis? Um, the government promised a new Bacon's uh, home tax. Um, they want people, it, the law says that it has to be um, occupied for less than 30 days. How are they gonna work this? Do you want a selfie in a house for 31 days for people to prove that they're in the houses? Again, a lack of common sense practicality. Uh, the vacant site tax, again, is in the future tense. It was mentioned last year, it is, is in the future tense. The government had a vacant site tax. In one year, they collected 21,000 euros in that vacant site tax. That was less money than it cost to draft the law. Again, when we talk about incompetency in this, go in this government, this are, these are the examples that we're looking at. Um, I want to talk briefly about the health sector, and the health sector is you know, a shining example of incompetency, lack of accountability, uh, in, and misgovernance. And we have, in AIMF, have done massive work in, in relation to this. Um, cervical check is, is, is a big issue for, for AIMF. Uh, we have a situation where the government apologized profoundly to the women that were wronged by cervical check. And they said that it would never happen again. They said that they would completely reform the system. And they said that women wouldn't be forced to go to court to seek justice. And then the women went ahead and forced the women to court to seek justice. Many of them, up to the day that they died, were forced to, to in, in, into court cases. An incredible situation. And we actually, and the work of, of uh, Luke Silk has been very important in this, we, 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 we basically brought, brought out, we exposed the facts that cervical check itself believes that they've done nothing wrong. That you have them in complete contradiction with the government who has apologised, with the Supreme Court who have paid out uh, to families. It's an incredible situation. In the McCrack report, they promised that tests would be screened, the, would be checked here in Ireland. 100% of the tests are still being sent to the United States and away. Uh, so that shows you nothing changes despite the PR apologies of this government. They are hollow apologies, they mean nothing, they do not help anybody. If they, if they focus more on helping people, 
they would do a better service for this country in the future. And I just, uh, Marie Tobin mentioned uh, the baby Christopher case, and this is a heartbreaking case. And this is another example where there was a late term abortion on a child that was fully healthy. It was an illegal abortion. Nobody ever held to account, nobody brought to justice in relation to this. The family pushed aside, swept under the carpet. The company, the private company that actually carried out the shoddy studies on it, do you think they paid for it? No, the state claims agency paid the costs in relation to that. The taxpayers of the people funded the bill for a private organization who broke the law. That's how Ireland works. And that has to change, and aim to will make sure it changes into the future. <laughs> and lucky that, uh, that Emmett isn't um, you know, telling me that my time is nearly up because I'm in big trouble at this stage. Just a, a couple of more points in, in the health sector. Um, South Curry Cam's unit, a specialist mental health uh, unit operating to help children who are vulnerable with mental health issues. And, and I can see our representatives here uh, from Curry today. It had no specialist consultant in mental health. It had a doctor with no special training in mental health, delivering services to very vulnerable children. Who's been held to account? Anybody. Is there anybody going to get, get uh, their job lost in this? Aim2 will promise you that in government, if a public servant does not fulfill their responsibility, senior public servants will lose their job forthwith. That's what I'm <laughs> the National Eternity Hospital, as another example of that kind of the, the culture wars taking over our country. So the National Maternity Hospital was designed to help women who were in serious trouble in relation to giving birth, to co-locate <laughs> hospitals together so that they would have rapid access to services if something went wrong uh, during giving birth. And yet it has been literally stopped. It has, because of a deadlock between warring factions of the cultural wars on whether or not it can provide abortions or not. That a maternity hospital designed to stop women losing their lives is, is not being built for decades as a result of this shows you the actual focus of many of our opponents. It's not for the welfare of women. It's not for the welfare of children. It's because of their culture wars, and that has to change as well. We want to see a change in the way the hospitals and the health services fund. So right now, Hospitals are funded on the basis of the amount of staff they have. And as a result, more staff, more management, more money comes into the hospitals. We want to see hospitals, primary health care centres, all the different units, north and south, funded on the basis of the amount of the operations that they have, the amount of therapies that they deliver, the amount of treatments that they deliver, so that the money goes to the front line, not to the back offices in relation to this. And that's part of the problem, that you know, the, the money is getting diverted from people who really need it. I have no doubt that HSC managers will completely increase the level of investment in health treatments if money is determined on that basis. And I want to give credit to Emer Tobin and the work that she has done in, in our area uh, on the health service on that as well. Just in relation to Garda, I want to mention this because it's an issue of crime and social behaviour is not being focused upon at the moment uh, with many political parties. It's a real issue. The fact that we have a person getting murdered in a graveyard in Tralee, minutes after a person has been buried, in what should be a sanctuary for people grieving is an absolute disgrace. The fact that we have a Garda car rammed by young thugs who basically will act with impunity. You know, I listened to a Sinn Féin councillor in the area and it struck me because he was asked to call that young thug a thug and he said, no, 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 we can't, we can't call them these names, he said. And I'm thinking, this is the party that would kneecap these guys a, a, a number of years ago. <laughs> An incredible situation. So what we're looking to do, for example, we will bring about a law in this state that will give a compulsory a custodial sentence to an individual who significantly assaults a guarder, a nurse, a person working in the fire service while they're working for this country. People put themselves in danger. 
But we will also invest in these communities too. We will also make sure that there is, that these communities are not forgotten about, that they're not left behind. Because if we leave these communities behind, first of all, on a humanitarian basis, it is absolutely wrong. But second of all, if you don't have any interest in humanity at all, it will cause society worse in the long run. We need to fix the problems that are causing these issues. Now, and just sexual assaults, domestic violence are radically increasing in this country. Um, you know, and it's aimed to, that is actually finding out this information uh, right now. Um, and I feel that the government are distracted the Minister for Justice is, is worried about laws, but who can say what things or where they can say them? While yet, in many parts of our society, we have people who are afraid to use public transport, people who are afraid to go out in their community at night. The government's priorities need to change about the real issues that are focused on people. I want to touch on farming very briefly. There are people standing outside a shopping centre in Cavan today, trying to get two cents extra on an egg so that they can feed their children. There are people standing out of shopping centres today who are forced to sell their pork for below the cost of production. And just a number of years ago, many of the reps that we have here stood outside of the factory gates in farms across the country in solidarity of farmers that are being forced to sell their beef for below the cost of production. And we will not stand for that anymore. Attachments in, in terms of this. I raised this at a committee with Katrina, Katrina Fall, uh, Minister for Agriculture, was there. Uh, he's the current minister, he was at the committee previously, and also the uh, Fine Gael chair. And I said we have to bring about a bill that will guarantee the co that farmers get a price above the cost of production. And they said that that was unre unreasonable. They stood up for the factories and the supermarkets who are making tens of billions of euros of profits, many of them not even paying tax in this country. Who are they meant to represent? They're meant to represent the farmers in their constituencies, not textile exiles in Luxembourg. Yeah. It was aimed to the first called out, the Zappone appointment. It was aimed to the first call for Robert Troy's resignation. We were to the fore with regards to Robert Watt's appointments and his grossly in, uh, obscene salary. We were the first people to call out the secondment of the Tony Houlihan. Indeed, actually, Paul Reed is now retired in large part because of our defence of hospital services in County Mead. We exposed. <laughs> we exposed uh, the wrongdoing uh, in relation to uh, the prison service, and this is something that's happening under people's radar at the moment. There are prison officers who are who are living in danger of their lives in prisons in this state where certain prison officers are going to prisoners in category A uh, wings, people who have you know, blood on their hands, and they're inciting violence against other prison officers. We have told the government on this, and again, they're sitting on their hands. We brought that issue to the fore. It was our party that's fighting for pluralism in education right now in this state. When this government is seeking to you know, delete the pluralism of this state in education, we're the only party fighting against this. We're fighting for the wild idea that parents should have a say over what's being taught to their children. I just want to give credit to uh, Councillor Cog and Councillor Sarah O'Reilly in terms of the fishing and the, the, the farming areas. We have built enormous credibility in those areas due to the work of those two councillors, and they should be appreciated here today. For The Mother and Baby Home Report was, was released a couple of years ago, and it was leaked to the press before the families uh, who themselves suffered as a result of those mother and baby homes. The Taoiseach said he'd have a, an investigation into it. Two years later, they're still investigating it. We actually put a question in to ask the Taoiseach, did he leak it to the press, maybe? He hasn't replied to that, unfortunately. <laughs> so, all of these points that I focused here on show a deep malaise, a deep dysfunction in Irish society, a political class radically removed from the people that they're meant to represent. And we are cursed to repeat all of that for generations, unless we the people change it. And that is the thing. 
Because remember, we, we, we spoke about the great growth of AIM2 over the last number of years, a phenomenal growth. I'll be honest, that's been built on too few sh shoulders. There are people bursting themselves in parts of the country, doing great work. We need more shoulders. We need it now. We can't wait. Don't sit on the sidelines and wait for us. in my years of political activism is that people don't know how strong the people are. People don't realize the power that they have themselves. And actually it suits the political class for that. So I actually think that the political class is actually banking on a docile um, uh, population. They're banking on people who are disempowered. Sometimes we see a spark of it. Sometimes around the, the water charges or around the pension crisis, people start to stand up for themselves. But what we need now is for this political organization, this movement of people, to become a catalyst in every town and village in this country to start to awaken in people's minds the actual power that they possess and start to educate those people that the, 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 the dysfunction that's happening in society is never, ever going to change unless we stand up to it. Now, we've seen these politicians U-turn on every single issue that we hold uh, important. And they will repackage these U-turns as in some way that they are evolving politically. You know, the doll and Stormont is stopped high with people who wrestle with their conscience and win every single time. It does not need any more, and we in AIM2 will not add to that stockpile of the future. because there's a good few people here from different political parties today as well as visitors and I, I want to welcome them. But we hear the word fluid, uh, fluidity used quite a bit now in modern politics. But Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Sinn Féin and the SDLP are politically fluid. They will go whichever direction the wind blows in terms of politics. And many people inside those political parties feel stranded as a result. Don't remain stranded in those parties. Don't facilitate parties in that you no longer believe in. Come and join a movement which stands for your values. Don't get angry with regards to what's happened. Get organized. Every day we see the social media, it's full of angry, disparate, political noise. But it's going nowhere. One of the big issues for AIM2 over the last while is to build a strong organization. Organization is key. So people need to plug in. I'm not asking for people to give hours and hours at a time. Maybe two hours a month to give to our organization. Before you go outside that door, sign up a membership form. What we do from today, from this meeting onwards, will define the country that this, our children will live in. Sign up to those membership forms and become involved in your local organization. AIM2, I believe, is the most important political organization, without a doubt, in this country. I, I, there are wonderful pro-life organizations in this state and they are the foundation of the campaign to realize the human rights of people. I might be wrong on this, but I think that AIM2 is now probably the biggest pro-life organization membership based in this country. And what I'm saying to you, we need your help. Don't stand on the outside looking in. Our growth and change depends on you. As citizens, we are all equally responsible for this democracy. More and more people are realizing it, and more and more people are joining our movement. And today, a Hortigwell is becoming increasingly obvious that AIM2 is emerging as the clear alternative to this broken political establishment. Arrival in the Kalia, AIM2, August Era Abu. of today's events is drawing to a close. Before you go, uh, people have been voting earlier in the day, and I believe there's a new Orcoria uh, that has uh, been elected. Um, and 
Yeah. I don't know the details of that. It'll be announced in just a couple of minutes. And I also say there's going to be a wonderful dinner dance later on. Enjoy yourselves. Have the crack. You deserve it for the work that you've done. Garmila Malagos, Galera.